All right, uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. I'm an adjunct professor uh, at the Department of uh, Engineering Science and one of the organizers of this lecture series. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sharam Maribani and also uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Kate Lab, uh, Lab who uh, helped me in organizing this, uh, this uh, uh, lecture series. Uh, on behalf of the uh, Engineering Science Department and uh, School of Science and Technology, let me welcome you all to this uh, ninth, ninth lecture for this academic year. And uh, the uh, 156 uh, lecture in the series uh, since we started in 2006. Uh, before I introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, let me just uh, uh, announce a couple of things. First of all, uh, we have very good pizza, which is going to arrive at 5.30, and I hope that you, you enjoy it. Uh, second, uh, they, uh, there is a class starting at 6 o'clock, and uh, we need to uh, basically leave the room uh, by 5.50 uh, so that we can clean the room for the, for the class. Yes? That class has been canceled. Is it? Okay. Yeah. That's by Dr. Uh, he's son. Son. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, I think, sick. He's sick. So yeah. You yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, then uh, our uh, next lecture will be next uh, Thursday. Uh, and the title of talk, in fact, maybe I should have put, uh, all right, I just say now. Uh, the title of talk is uh, uh, Why is Agricultural Monitoring and Control? Uh, so hard, a decade of learning, by Mr. March Hol uh, Holler, uh, founder of uh, Kamali Networks uh, in Napa, California. Our guest speaker for today is uh, Mr. Mark Thorin, and the title of his talk is uh, Power Electronics and Its Threat. Mr. Mark Thorin joined Linear Technology, now a part of Analog Devices in 2001, as an application engineer supporting precision data converters. He has since held various roles in mixed signal applications, including evaluation systems, training, technical publications, and customer support. Mark recently joined Analog Devices, the system development group where he works on uh, reference designs and developing educational material for the Analog Devices University program. Mark has a Bachelor of Science in Architectural Mechanical Engineering and a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering, both from University of Maine. So here is Mark. All right, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, like you said, uh, my name is Mark Thorin, um, and I've uh, been with um, analog devices slash linear technology since 2001. Uh, do people still recognize the name linear technology? A couple people do, okay, got it. So uh, it was a, a great company, um, mostly focusing on power electronics. So I was a bit of an oddball in the mixed signal department there, but I was surrounded by these brilliant minds that were um, solving really difficult problems in, in power electronics, and we'll talk about a bunch of those today. Um, so my title still doesn't say anything about power, uh, but uh, like he said, I do do an awful lot of system design. So building reference designs for customers, building evaluation boards, and of course, everything needs power, or else it wouldn't be electronic. Um, Hello? If this doesn't work, we'll just uh, use our keyboard then. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, there we go. Okay, um, I promise this is the most text on the slide and I'm not even gonna read most of it here. Um, just to point out a couple of things we won't talk about. So we won't talk about things like um, high voltage power distribution, you know, 10, 20, 30 kilovolt uh, power distribution uh, and power lines and things of that nature. Um, vehicle powertrains, so like the big power that, uh, that you'd find in a, a Tesla's, Tesla's powertrain or um, industrial motors or things like that. 
Um, but what is on topic is things like um, servers, compute farms, uh, portable electronics, uh, industrial electronics, and automotive accessories. So all of this infotainment stuff that's invading our cars. Um, let's see. So my boss always makes me give a couple of slides about uh, analog devices. So we had one hand for linear technology. Um, who, who doesn't recognize analog devices? Okay, so, so a couple, couple people here. So we make um, all kinds of stuff. Um, mixed signal electronics is probably one of the strong points. So analog to digital, digital to analog converters, uh, radio electronics, um, you know, things for uh, sensors, healthcare, uh, industrial automation. Uh, we make gyroscopes and accelerometers, which are pretty fun to play around with. Um, Internet of Things, so little radio chips and things of that nature, and with the acquisition of linear technology um, power as well. What you don't see up there is microprocessors, FPGAs, um, DRAM, SRAM, uh, Flash, and things like that. Um, those are noble industries, but um, I'd rather work in analog. It's a lot more fun. Um, you know, the company itself, it's a 50-year-old company, which is pretty venerable. Um, you know, the fact that I've been at this place for almost 20 years, that never happens in Silicon Valley, and yet here we are, or here I am, uh, and here Analog Devices is 50 years later. Um, it's headquartered in Norwood. It's a medium-sized company with 15,000 employees, and we have 45,000 products. So that's op amps, converters, all kinds of interesting toys. And um, we sell to everybody. Uh, when I interviewed at Linear Tech, my uh, hiring manager said that there's not a box made in this country that doesn't have a Linear Tech part in it. And I take apart a lot of boxes, and that's true. Um, and it's even more true with analog devices, of course. And we're also worldwide. We've got design centers in California, Colorado, uh, Germany, just pretty much everywhere. So. Um, I took this slide from Leonard Stargett, one of our um, <clears throat> one of our fellows who made who's a real innovator in uh, in low noise butt converters, and uh, his comment about this was, you know, you see all kinds of stuff about um, March of the Machines, artificial intelligence, and you know maybe the future will look like the Terminator or something like that, uh, but one thing's for certain. Both of these things will be loaded with butt converters and boost converters and power electronics. So who brought their switching regulators today? No one? Okay, so we got one, one hand up there. So um, how many switching regulators do you think you own? Well, smartphone might have 12 in it. Laptop is 16, flat panel TV, 10. Um, think about Wi-Fi routers, modems, and all that stuff. You know, most of these little boxes have a 12-volt wall adapter, so there's a switching regulator in there. Um, those are often very low cost, a market that analog devices doesn't play in. But once that 12 volts enters your box, you know, no semiconductors run on 12 volts anymore. It's all 3.3 volts and 1 volt and 0.7, you know, much, much lower. And so there's a lot of switching regulators there. And your car is full of them. So, you know, cars have infotainment systems, sensors everywhere, um, and almost every, every individual little box or sensor has a local regulator of some sort. So this is absolutely pervasive. And automotive electronics is really challenging because it has to work at minus 40 degrees C in northern Alaska. It's got a work in, uh, in Death Valley, so when, uh, you know, when the temperature's sky high. And uh, not only that, you, know, you picture Death Valley, it's hot already. Once the engine heats up and once your electronics heat up, you've got a lot of challenges there. Um, cars also are very sensitive to electromagnetic interference. So these circuits have to work and they have to be whisper quiet. They can't transmit radio interference. So, you know, 250 regulators that you personally own is probably an underestimate. So, they're everywhere. And we can slice and dice that category into a bunch of things. Um, linear regulators. So, who's used a, a linear regulator? LM7805, LM317. Okay, so most people have used those in their product, in their projects. Um, who's used a switching regulator? Okay, so a couple of hands on switching regulators. So um, switching regulators are harder to use. You've got a chip, you've got a hook and inductor to it. It's, um, th there's a lot more to building a switching regulator circuit, uh, which means if you, you know, if you study that, you can extract um, money from that, which is what analog devices does. 
Um, but there's also some esoteric things, right? Power over Ethernet. So um, power over Ethernet is sending power and data over the same lines. So things like IP telephones and things of that nature. Um, that power is typically sent at 48 volts that then has to be bucked down to five volts and isolated. So electrically isolated from the wire coming in. So all kinds of nice little challenges there. Um, energy harvesting, so little boxes that sit out in the middle of nowhere and extract energy from their environment to sense temperature or environmental conditions. So lots of different categories. Um, one slide on switching regulator history here. So if you look at a switching regulator, you've got an inductor or a transformer, and um, you can't put DC across an inductor because the current will skyrocket. You have to chop it up somehow. And there, historically, that was done in a, a number of different ways. Um, does anyone recognize what those boxes are? D does anyone, uh, anyone um, restore old cars or study old cars? Okay, so those are spark coils from a Model T Ford. So it's six volts DC in from a battery and kilovolts AC out. Um, and, and you know, my, my dad and I used to make Jacob's ladders out of these things. It's you know, it'll throw a nice one inch spark. Um, that's before they, that's before spark plugs were good enough to ignite with a single spark. So this thing would put out a continuous arc when you energized it. So if the gasoline didn't fire on the first spark, then another one would come along, and then it would eventually work. Um, in vacuum tube radios and uh, avionics and things of that nature, you might find something that looked like that little guy there. And what this is, it's a vibrator or a trembler. So it's a little electromagnetic circuit that sits there and chops the current into a transformer that would then be post-regulated somehow, rectified and then regulated. Um, and you can hear these things when they're running, so they sit there and buzz. But of course, that's not very nice or very efficient. So um, 1976 was when the first sort of integrated circuit switching regulators came about. So there were various discrete implementations. You know, think about discrete transistors, resistors, and capacitors. But really, 1976 was the first switching regulator in a chip uh, by Signetics. And that was a voltage mode controller. So that means I look at the output voltage. If it's too high, I reduce the duty cycle to my drive circuitry. If it's too low, I increase the duty cycle. And um, there's a lot of... Um, problems with, uh, with controlling voltage mode that way. If I have an output short circuit, then my switch turns on continuously and, and things blow up. Um, it turns out that controlling current rather than voltage is a, uh, ha has a lot of advantages. And you know, really, I'm not gonna go into any detail there, except to say that um, if you go to, uh, so Ray Ridley was one of the pioneers in this field, and he's got his, um, PhD dissertation up on his website. And it's kind of funny because if you read through it, it's dissertation and then an advertisement for his company, for his website, and then dissertation and he's got advertisements sort of sprinkled around it. Um, but that's his right if he's giving away this material for free. Um, one thing I should have said at the start of the presentation, you can, in an hour, it's really hard to transfer any sort of knowledge, any sort of useful technical bits. So really the objective here is to get you interested, to maybe look some of this stuff up afterwards. And, and we'll provide the, I'll, I'll uh, send um, uh, Professor Kajuri the uh, slide deck as well. So this paper from Ray Ridley really goes through, it, it's a really nice um, progression of the analysis, you know, going from voltage mode to current mode control, developing these, these fundamental concepts of, um, of, of power electronics. And um, you know, then along comes linear technology, and one of our um, pioneer, some of our pioneering work was in um, buck boost converters. So a boost converter takes a low voltage and makes a high voltage. A buck converter takes a high voltage and makes a low voltage. And if I have enough switches, then I can make a circuit that does both. And it's actually not that hard to do that. What is difficult is to transition cleanly between the two. So if I'm regulating five volts out, how do I go from four volts, four and a half, five volts? How do I cleanly transition between buck mode and boost mode without things going crazy and getting noisy and, and going unstable? So that's really where um, Linear Tech had some, uh, some pioneering work. And so where does all that energy go? Um, I, uh, 
I'm picking on Bitcoin a little bit here because you know a lot of our parts go into servers and FPGA boards and processor boards, and uh, a lot of those get used for Bitcoin mining. So has anyone seen those news articles that say how um, Iceland spends more energy or burns more energy mining bitcoins than on the rest of the country? So that's that's a lot of energy. So this is power that gets generated at a power plant, 110 volts eventually or 220 or whatever they have in Iceland, then down to 45 volts or 48 volts, and then down to one volt using one of these buck converters. and what is that, 75 terawatt hours per year gets burned mining, mining bitcoins at 0.7 volts. So I don't have an intuitive sense of how big that is, but it sounds like a lot of energy, 75 terawatt hours. Okay, um, and if it wasn't Bitcoin, it would be something else. It would be you know video streaming or Netflix or something like that or cloud storage. That's where a lot of this energy gets burned and there's, there's a lot of challenges with, uh, with doing that. So bitcoins and searches and streaming get handled by boards that look like that. So it's a big processor or an FPGA. Um, I think all of the, uh, the bitcoin mining is now done on GPUs or you know, high, high processor count GPUs or, or FPGAs. Um, anytime you need custom logic, it has to be in an FPGA. Um, but what I really love about this photo here is that the total board real estate devoted to linear tech power modules is bigger than the payload itself. It's bigger than that, that massive FPGA. So, you know, powering these chips is, is a challenge. If you look at the data sheet, it will say, I need 1.0 volts plus minus 2%. And that can go from zero amps to 100 amps in no time. So there's a lot of, um, uh, it, it, it's a challenge just, get, just feeding these darn things. Okay, and then, um, and then thinking of powering itself, uh, power enters a board like this at 12 volts or 24 volts or 48 volts. Those voltages are climbing up and up and up. Now, why, why would I want to send 48 volts into a board like this instead of 12 volts? Any, any guesses? So how thick a wire do I have to um, send into this? Or if I have a bunch of these in a back plane, right, higher voltage, what happens to my current? Yeah, so the current, the current is lower. So if I have 12 volts versus 48 volts, I can use a wire with a quarter, a, a quarter as much copper. So, but I do transfer some of that challenge to the, uh, to the board itself. Okay, um, and then what about these, these cloud farms and these server farms? I've got big racks of computers here. If one dies, do I want to power down the whole rack so I can change it? Wouldn't it be nicer if I can yank out one card and slide in another? And of course, that's what's done. But uh, how do I avoid disturbing the whole rack? How do, I, uh, how do I make that possible? And if I look at this thing, I've got a whole bunch of capacitors on the board there. If I have a discharge capacitor at zero volts and I plug it into a 48 volt power supply, what happens? Pardon? So, so I get a, a massive slug of current, right? So I have a discharged bucket, a discharged capacitance, and I have to charge it all of a sudden to 48 volts in zero time if I just connect those darn things. So that's the first problem we'll look at here. So what this represents is a backplane. So one of those compute boards that I'm gonna stick into a backplane and I've got this massive output capacitor. Is this reasonably easy to see from back there? Okay, yeah, so I have this massive capacitor and that's providing the, the bulk bypass for my switching regulators. And the way most of these backplanes are work is that I've got long pins and short pins. So I've got an input voltage and ground and as I insert this backplane, my power contacts make contact first and I've got no capacitance here, so that's fine. I can charge a zero capacitance or a low capacitance node up to 48 volts and everybody's happy. Um, and then I have a short pin. So the power pins connect and then I hit this short pin and then that tells this little controller, hey, the back plane is completely seated, now it's okay to start that power up process. 
And the way I do that is with a bunch of N-channel MOSFETs. So instead of all of a sudden connecting that capacitor to 48 volts directly, I gently ramp up the I gently ramp up the voltage. So the voltage climbs up, 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 up. And if I look at this, see if the little pointer goes, this is the voltage from drain to source. So I start out at a high voltage, 48 volts, and then my output voltage climbs up, 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 and eventually settles out. My current, this is the current that it takes to charge the output capacitor from zero volts to 48 volts. This is the temperature of the MOSFET. So when I've got voltage across my MOSFET and I've got current going through it, I'm burning power. And any time I burn power, my MOSFET starts to get hot. And as long as I don't get too hot, then everybody's happy. And this is a timer pin. So the, per the job of this controller is to monitor what's going on, the MOS going on around the MOSFET and shut it off if things go haywire, if, if something happens. And lots of things can happen. I can ramp too fast. That would cause you know, too much current to flow. Um, my output capacitor could short circuit. I could have some catastrophic failure on my board. And if I have a short capacitor that starts a fire, then that board is probably toast. What I don't want to do is take down the input power supply. I don't want to take down the rest of the boards in my back plane there. So there's all kinds of different conditions to consider where I need to protect that MOSFET. And it turns out that's a, a difficult problem. It's really easy to get a high voltage MOSFET. It's really easy to get a MOSFET with very low on resistance, like for a switching regulator or something like that. But it's really difficult to get a MOSFET that handles these thermal stresses, these really big slugs of energy. And you can actually throw money at a problem like this. You can go out and buy a MOSFET from Ixis, which is headquartered down in Milpitas there. Um, but those things cost eight, $8 a piece. It's a big, massive MOSFET, so it takes up a lot of board space and it drains the customer's money. So how are we solving that problem? Oh, high MOSFETs, multiple MOSFETs is more money. Okay. Um, so the way we're solving that problem is with a fancy um, with a fancy hot swap controller that doesn't just say, hey, something's going on, I'm going to charge up this timer capacitor, I'm going to start a timer. What we're doing here is we actually build a little circuit with R's and C's that models the thermal behavior of the MOSFET. So what we're doing here, this controller is doing all its same job, it's ramping up the power and you know, turning things on and off. But in addition to that, it's me actively measuring the voltage across the MOSFET and the current through it. So it knows how much power is being dissipated. More power, it stuffs more current into this RC network. And the reason I've got multiple RCs is because I need to shut off the MOSFET a lot faster if I've got more power being dissipated. If I've got less power just being dissipated, then I can wait a little bit longer and longer and so on. So seemingly interesting problem. All I'm doing is, is turning on a board and you can see that there's all kinds of really sort of esoteric challenges involved here. It, question so far? Okay. Oh, yeah, and, and in reality here. So, um, and actually I've got the patent number up here. So um, this, is, this is a really novel idea done by one of our design engineers um, worth patenting. So interesting stuff and there's a pretty good description there. Um, so another sort of trend here is, you know, there's an awful lot of pins on, on a part like this. Um, who knows what SDA and SCL are? If I have a, a couple of digital pins called SDA and SCL, what, what bus is that? I, I squared C? Oh, um, has anyone hooked an Arduino up to, I, I, I see a nod there, has anyone hooked an Arduino up to a sensor or something using I squared C communication? Okay, so uh, crickets, but I guess what I'll say is, so a part like this, even though it's just a, a switch to turn on a MOSFET, this one has an I squared C interface on it. And it turns out that that chip also has 
a lot of telemetry features, you know, features to measure things like um, power supply input voltage, current, uh, total energy, total energy dissipated, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and people more and more want um, knowledge, right? They want to know how much power this board is taking. Um, and th that's for a number of reasons. You know, one of, one of the reasons would be for um, like load leveling. So if I have a, a server farm or something like that, and I want to measure, I, I throw this much computation at one particular server board, how much does it, its energy increase? Um, the other reason is for diagnostics. If I have a board whose energy consumption is creeping up, 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 do I have leaky capacitors? Are my power supplies starting to fail? Things of that nature. So it's for you know, operational optimization and for things like diagnostics. Um, and it turns out that uh, this part in particular also has a little black box, just like an airplane. And what I mean by that is there's, a, there's actually EEPROM in this thing, so non-volatile memory. And a lot of these parts will have an extra little capacitor on it whose only job is to provide just enough energy to write fault data to EEPROM when a catastrophic failure happens. So a board with a chip like this, you know, if something does happen, you get an overvoltage fault or you get a short circuit fault or something crazy happens, you can take this thing out and see what happened in the few seconds just before that failure occurred. So all kinds of interesting things are creeping their way into something as mundane as a power switch. Um, and these things are fun to play with. I snapped this picture in our lab here. Um, that's the eval board for one of these things. And it's a little hard to see, but it's got this massive copper clamp on it. You know, these are 100, 200 amp devices here. Um, so if you like sparks and you like to see things blow up, then these are really fun to play with. And we have all kinds of custom, uh, custom boxes with labels like shorting module and load dump generator. So we have to build our own test equipment in order to fully exercise these things and, and fully you know, make sure that we're covering all the cases that, our, um, that our, our customers can throw at it. Okay. All right, so we've got, we managed to turn the power on to our board. Okay, so now what? We've got 48 volts into the board. How do we take 48 volts and get down to that 0.9 volt, 1 volt, 0.7 volt that that FPGA or processor requires. Well, we talked about the advantages to a higher input voltage. We've got lower currents and lower resistance, lower IR losses in our wiring. Um, but that problem now gets offloaded to the board itself. And I came across this in a, a news article on our, on our website a while back, the idea of using a um, hybrid converter. So a Buck converter is an inductor followed by a capacitor, and I switch my input between ground 48 volts, ground 48 volts. Um, but it turns out that if I'm switching this high voltage MOSFET, my, my uh, switching losses are, are quite high with that high input voltage. Well, what if I can take 48 volts and magically drop it by a factor of two with very high efficiency? So I'm not going to close the loop. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to do any adjustments. Just whatever my input voltage is, cut it down by a factor of two. And that's exactly what this LTC7821 does. And the way it does that is by charging two capacitors in series to 48 volts and then discharge them in parallel. Charge in series, discharge in parallel. And we call the one that's up top here the flying capacitor because it flies up to 48 volts, flies down to 24, fly up to 48, fly down to 24. So it sounds like a lot of complexity. I've got a lot of switches, I've got a, these extra capacitors on my board, and it turns out that that's 99% efficient, and I can use a much, much smaller inductor because I'm operating at 24 volts now, my switching speed can shoot back up again. So this hybrid topology allows you to, it gives you a lot more knobs for optimization. I can trade off board space with efficiency and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and this switch capacitor stage, when you look at the power in to power out, this will, the density, the volume density of, of that energy flow is 4,000 watts per square inch, or per cubic inch. So a little one cubic inch switch capacitor converter will convert 4,000 watts from, 
48 volts down to 24. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. So you've got this stage, and then you follow it by a standard buck stage here. So once again, just a, a way that we're trying to tackle these, uh, these difficult problems. Okay, um, customers don't like to design discrete circuits. They like to put little boxes on their boards. Um, and so here's another example of a sort of a, a high voltage to core type device here. And it's just a photo of a, of a power module here. And um, I guess the point of this slide is that we're multidisciplinary. So to make a part like this, it's, it's silicon design, it's power controllers and things of that nature. But if I look at the block diagram, I've got power switches in here, but I've got this massive digital block in the middle as well. So it's also a mixed signal design with data converters and state machines, fault detection and, and uh, protection and things of that nature. Um, packaging. So if I look at this thing, it's a little miniature circuit board. But if I look at the top, it's all magnetic material. So it's a combination of circuit board, solder, bond wires, magnetic material, all packaged up in a, a neat little box like that. Um, and of course, if I had this digital engine with my, um, with my I squared C interface on this thing, then I need embedded code. So we've, we take embedded classes here as part of the program, as part of your program. Yeah, so Arduino programming and things like that. Um, has anyone heard of the Linduino? Does that ring a bell at all? So, so Linduino is a, um, that's a board that Linear Tech released. It's basically an Arduino clone. And we actually use Arduino to demonstrate these parts and as a way to deliver our, our source code to drive these things. So, um, and, and I think that's tapering off a little bit because the, the Arduino Uno is, is pretty limited in terms of memory. But it just sort of drives home the point that in order to turn the in order to turn on this buck regulator, I need software support around it. Um, and then more and more customers are looking for Linux drivers as well. So if you go to um, kernel.org, which is the source code for Linux for the Linux kernel, you'll see drivers in there for quite a big population of you know ADI parts and power parts in particular. So you know, it, it truly is a, uh, a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary little box here. And I think this one is um, 48, volts to, 48 volts to one volt at 50 amps. So that's, uh, that's a lot of amps. Okay, so this will take 48 volts and create one power supply. Almost nothing uses a single power supply. Right, so this is a, an eval board for one of um, Freescale's core IQ processors here. And I count up 16 power rails on this thing. And parts like this, it's not enough to just turn on all 16 power supplies at once. There's very specific sequencing requirements. I have to bring up my core voltage first, and then I have to bring up another voltage, and then I have to bring up another voltage. And so that is a, um, that's a challenge in and of itself. Right, so how do I take all these converters? I'm, I'm lucky if I can talk to one converter through a digital bus, but what if I have a bunch of other converters here that are dumb converters, for lack of a better word, that aren't smart converters? So yet another trend is digitally managed power. The idea of, taking, of, of making a device or, or making a system here, and this, this actually shows it pretty clearly. So I have this power manager here, and it goes in and diddles the feedback pin of my switching regulator. It also touches the run pin, so I can shut my regulator on and off. And there was, when we were first developing these chips, God, it's been like 10 years now at least, um, we didn't know if this market would take off or not because it doesn't sound difficult, right? This is a, I can control this pin with a microcontroller and I can control this with a really cheesy D to A converter, and I can measure my voltage with an A to D converter. Sounds like a simple job. You can do that with your Arduino. But it turns out when you've got 16 power supplies and you've got to propagate faults and you've got to monitor all these conditions, it, it turns into a really big problem. So a part like the, um, the LTC2978 here, this has a full-blown floating point microprocessor in it. And its only purpose in life 
is to manage these power supplies and shut things, turn things on and off. Um, I also use the word margining here. And what margining is, you know, if I look at a board like this, I've got a processor, I've got memory, I've got all kinds of digital circuitry out there. And what happens to the speed of a digital part when my power supply voltage increases? Faster or slower? Get guesses? Yeah. So it, it, it tends to get faster. Um, and depending on the way my digital buses are configured, you know, faster is sometimes good, but sometimes not so good, right? I might violate a hold time on a bus or something like that. So what margining is, is this idea of ramping up all my power supplies and then I'm going to nudge the power supplies all to their maximum value and make sure that my board still works. And then I'm going to margin them down to my minimum value and make sure all of my circuitry still works here. So that's a way of sort of proving out that your board is robust, that all your timing is not going to, it, your timing is not going to break due to little power supply variations and, and things like that. So you know, once again, a really powerful diagnostic tool here. If I, can, if I have you know, control over all the power supplies on my board, I can go in and really make things work. Um, I, I'll often say that hacking is getting something to work and engineering is knowing how unbroken it is. And so this is a way of finding out how unbroken your circuit is. Um, and then before we move on to a few other things here, um, digi analog versus digitally managed versus digital power, which is really mixed signal here. So um, all of these previous controllers that I've talked about, these previous power supplies, are fundamentally analog in nature. And I stole this from uh, EE Times here. And what that means is I have an analog circuit that drives some MOSFETs, and I've got an analog amplifier and a comparator and a latch and a little ramp generator that controls all my timing here. And that is, um, that, that's, that's per pretty pervasive. That's still the dominant, um, dominant topology here. What digital power is, is the idea, is everyone knows digital has to be better than analog, right? Has to be. No, that's not necessarily the case. Um, but if I can replace my error amplifier with an analog to digital converter, and I replace all of this analog circuitry with a digital PID loop, then I can do some, I can do some neat tricks. And what this is really, what, what the, this is possible, of course, um, and what it's waiting for is process technology to keep up with it. So this has been, this has been sort of a pipe dream for a while, you know, this idea of, oh, I don't want to do analog compensation anymore. Why can't I just do everything in the digital world like I do with my FPGA? And the reason is I need to, I need to do this, you know, 200 times in my collection of 200 switching regulators. So it, it's waiting for process technology to get small enough to where this makes economic sense. And it's starting to get there. So ADP 1055 is an example of a true digital power supply controller. So it will sit down here, it measures the output voltage with an A to D converter, it measures these really fast ramp ups of inductor current with an analog to digital converter, and all of the compensation and control is done in the digital domain. Um, and this is always a double-edged sword because engineers love to turn knobs, right? And this only has one, one or two knobs. I've got a current compensator, I have one compensation pin to twiddle. This thing is full of knobs and engineers will find a way to break it. Okay, now on to something completely different here. Um, so we talked about big power, things that mine bitcoins and things that you'd find in a, in a data farm or in a, um, like a compute farm of some sort. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is really, really micro power stuff. So think about ambient sensors. Um, Internet of Things is, a, uh, is a, a buzzword that you hear quite often here. And this part in particular struck me. I was um, walking across the, uh, the area that tests out our, all of our evaluation boards, and I looked at this board, and it said 5 volts out, 50 millivolts in. Right, so 50 millivolts at the input of this thing boosted up to 5 volts. A, tr a bipolar transistor starts to turn on at 700 millivolts. 
and a MOSFET starts to turn on at several volts. So how the heck do I do that? And the, re the way we do that is this, um, the circuitry in here uses depletion mode devices. So these are devices that have a small amount of gain even with very, very low voltages. And if I look at the input here, the first thing that this 50 millivolt source sees is a 100 to 1 transformer, or a 1 to 100 transformer here. So through a combination of high turns ratio transformers, depletion mode devices, I can make a little box here that will extract energy from thermoelectric coolers. In fact, I was walking down the hallway here and I saw a project based on that, like a little uh, thermo, thermoelectric generator that would sit on the back of someone's hand and generate enough power, enough, uh, enough uh, usable energy to do something. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is, um, was using one of those thermoelectric coolers with a copper slug as a heat sink. And this thing got thrown into a, um, into a stream and it extracted energy from the nighttime, daytime, nighttime temperature changes as the heat flowed into and out of this slug of copper. So this opens up all kinds of interesting applications, being able to do this sort of thing. Um, getting energy from the motion of a buoy. If I just have a little electromagnetic something or other that's sitting there generating a small amount of energy, you know, maybe it's enough to take one temperature reading per hour and send it up to a satellite radio once a day. Um, powering wearables and ingestibles. So I see these things hanging out of people's ears all the time. Um, so that's a pretty, um, they don't fit in my ears, they fall out. But uh, that is a, a pretty interesting engineering challenge. It's a, a radio, it's a battery, it's charging circuitry, it's switching regulators. Um, we don't sell into things like this because they're you know, sort of consumer grade. But if I look at a medical grade device like this, um, like this little camera that you swallow that takes a picture as it's flowing through you, that is a uh, that's a pretty interesting challenge. How do I get? How do I take a battery and how do I you know manage the power for a, a thing like this? So you know, consumer grade, I can use jelly bean parts. For medical grade devices, the constraints are a little bit higher, and that's where something like this cool little part would come in. And so this is a little two millimeter device here that's targeted at things like hearing aids, things like medical devices where, you know, unlike AirPods, these things just drop down in their charger, they're not hermetic. So I've got metal contacts that charge this thing. But if I have a medical device, I have to have it sealed up. I can't have exposed metal. I really can't charge it that way. So this little widget uses a coil that's built into the circuit board. So we don't even bother making a separate charge coil. It's just a few turns of copper trace on the circuit board. And this handles charging of a battery of a lithium ion cell, as well as regulation of an output voltage here. So a pretty magical little part that um, you know, solves, a, solves an interesting power problem here. Okay, um, a little digression here. Who's used LT Spice before? Okay, so a bunch of hands, and I, and I was happy to see it on a bunch of posters out there as well. So um, LT Spice has an interesting history. It started out as a, uh, it, it, its name was originally SwitcherCAD because it was a simulator that was optimized for switching power regulators. And uh, Mike Engelhart was, um, uh, took over that project at one point, um, really genius, uh, smart guy. And, um, there's this YouTube interview where someone asks him, what's the purpose, what's the point of LT Spice? And they say, is it a sanity check? And his reply is, no, if you need your sanity check, then go see a therapist. Um, is it how you verify the design? Well, that's not the case either. That gets done on the bench. And so what is the point? And the point is to build, build intuition. And I guess the example I like to give is you can test one condition on your bench, you can test another condition at the other end of the spectrum on your bench, and if LT spice matches here and LT spice matches here, using simulation I can test all of those intermediate cases. I can use LT spice to probe areas of operation of my circuit, to build intuition, to make sure that I really understand how the darn thing works. Okay. So let's move from switching regulators to linear regulators. I saw a couple of hands go up when I asked about using a, an LM7805. Um, 
That is Bob Weidler. So you've heard of the Weidler current mirror, presumably. So Weidler did some uh, you know, pioneering work in some of the really basic, uh, basic semiconductor circuits here. And so in 1967, so prior to the release of that first um, switching regulator, there was uh, a lot of debate out there about whether it's possible to even make a monolithic regulator. Because I need a power circuit, I need a voltage reference, and voltage references, when I heat them up and cool them down, the voltage drifts. So he wrote a whole bunch of letters to a bunch of magazines saying, I'm the expert, it's impossible. And then two months later releases the LM109 and says, okay, it is possible. And so his purpose of him saying that was to throw the competition off and uh, you know, sort of ho hopefully they give up the ghost. Um, but yeah, he uh, profited greatly on, uh, on that first linear regulator there. And if you look up Bob Weidler and look up uh, Google image searches, you'll find some pictures of him that are politically incorrect that I refuse to put in a presentation. But he had a, a really interesting personality. Okay, um, this was a t-shirt that was done by one of our switching regulator, sorry, one of our uh, linear regulator engineers, one of our staff scientists here. And this sort of sums it up, right? Why do I use an LDO? Well, I can use it to take nine volts from a battery down to five volts, so I can use it in battery circuits. But really what it's often used for is cleaning up the output of a switcher. So I have some switching regulator that intuitively I know it's got some switching noise on it, and I clean it up with a, regulate, with a linear regulator. And if you look at this little graph here, you see that the input to the LDO is noisy and the output is a lot less noisy. But if you look closer, you see that that's 10 millivolts per division, and that's 10 microvolts per division. So a factor of several thousand improvement in terms of noise. And that is, um, yeah, interesting, interesting t-shirt there, just to sort of illustrate the point. So let's uh, put some numbers behind that. So um, the LT3042 is this low noise regulator, right? So, um, and, and I'll, I'll ask the question here, who's comfortable working with nanovolts per root hertz? with noise numbers like that. That would be a great subject for another lecture. I, I have one sort of pre-canned that gives sort of an intuitive sense of, of noise, these nanovolts per root hertz. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can here. So um, the, the LT3042 has a couple of really interesting properties. One is this ability to clean up an input voltage. If I wiggle the input, the output doesn't wiggle. And that's shown on this graph here. And what it shows is at 100 hertz, if I wiggle the input at a frequency of 100 hertz, then the wiggle at the output is a million times smaller. So it's really, really good at rejecting that wiggles at the input here. And a ferrite bead actually can't do that, right? If you think about filtering, if I think about how do I filter wigg wiggles at 100 hertz, that's a fairly low frequency. I need a really big inductor, really big capacitors, really big resistors. And a ferrite bead won't do the job. Ferrite beads and, and inductive solutions only kick in at very high frequencies. So that's one thing that this is good for. The other thing it's good for is low noise. So if I have a, if I have a steady input voltage, I'm not wiggling it around, the output noise spectrum of this thing is whisper quiet. And we know that resistors have a certain amount of noise to them. And we know that larger resistors are noisier. A, uh, a 1K resistor is about 4 nanovolts per root hertz. A 50 ohm resistor has a noise of about 1 nanovolt per root hertz, or about, one, about 0.9 volts. And out at 1 kilohertz or so, the noise of this regulator is about double a 50 ohm resistor, which is just whisper, whisper quiet. So if you have an application that is super sensitive to noise, then a part like this will come in. So what is an example of that application? Well, here's a board that I designed some time ago, and I got completely screwed by switching regulator noise on this thing. So this was an evaluation board for a 32-bit analog to digital converter. It's really like you know 24, 25, 26 bits, depending on settings and all that. But the point is, if I have any noise anywhere on this board, I can see it because that converter is so darn sensitive. And I did rev one, 
and it was noisy. I had all these little noise mountains in my spectrum here. So I beefed up my capacitance, I put a filter at the input of my reference, and I tried to fix it, and no difference. I was completely baffled as to what was going on here. And so then I grabbed the evaluation board for, the, for that LT3042, and I wired it in, and I pre-regulated my voltage reference that my A to D converter did. And, and I apologize for these not being the same input signal here. I took this data a long, long time ago, and I, I had since lost it. Uh, but I did find an example of before and after. So before, I should see this you know, nice little rectangular spectrum, but I had these, these weird little ears here because switching regulator noise from my FPGA board was bleeding in. And afterwards, you know, I, get, I get none of that. You know, clean sine wave in, these are expected distortion products, but I had a nice flat noise spectrum over here. So you know, here's an example where I have a 12 volt wall wart coming in from the outside world into my FPGA board, 12 volts coming across my connector, you know, clean 12 volts regulated, but that noise was bleeding through my voltage reference of my A to D converter, and, uh, and it was you know, coming up to bite me. So um, anyway, so that is taking advantage of the silicon ferrite bead aspect of that device. Cool. Okay, so what about, um, what about voltage noise? So it, it's good at rejecting, input, at rejecting noise at its input. What about that whisper quiet output? Where do I really need that? And the answer is in a radio application. So if I have a, a software-defined radio or something of that nature where I've got a, a phase lock loop internally, the way a phase lock loop works, of course, is I have some reference, reference frequency, a phase detector, a charge pump and loop filter, and then I've got this voltage-controlled oscillator out here. So voltage-controlled oscillator takes my, the output of my loop filter and translates it to a frequency that's used by my, by my radio. And a VCO has at least four pins on it. It has a ground pin, it has a control signal, and it has an output, and it has a power signal, or a, a power pin. And it turns out that most VCOs have terrible power supply rejection. If my power supply is wiggling, then my output frequency moves, and I end up with an elevated phase noise spectrum here. So power supply noise directly affects my signal to noise ratio of my, of my radio. And um, so this is a, an article that sort of goes over one example here. Um, the example that they use says that anything greater than 11 nanovolts per root hertz will elevate the noise of the VCO that, I guess it's the ADF 4350 um, phase lock loop here. So here's a case where power supply noise directly impacts the performance of a radio. And 11 nanovolts per root hertz, I know we may not have a, uh, too much, uh, we may not have much intuition about whether that's um, um, uh, noisy or quiet, but that is pretty quiet. There's a lot of op amps that have noise a lot higher than that. And we're asking for a power supply with less noise than that. Um, and I thought I had some numbers in here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I did some, um, I went and looked up the noise of, a, of an LM317, sort of the garden variety regulator, and it's a thousand times higher than that. So if, if you take a, if you take a, um, you know, a nine volt battery and you wanna make five volts, that 7805 generic regulator is absolutely gonna kill the performance of your PLL. So just because it says linear regulator on the front page of the data sheet doesn't mean it's quiet. And if there's no noise spec in the data sheet, it doesn't mean there's no noise. It means it's so terrible they don't wanna talk about it. Okay, and then just a couple of other examples here. Um, you know, LM317 is generic. Um, it's the year is 2020. Do we need any more linear regulators? Well, the, our linear regulator designers are constantly busy. Um, so things like linear regulators that I can stack in parallel, um, regulators that take you know, really high input voltages, something like uh, for a housekeeping power supply in, a, uh, in an automobile or something like that. So there's all kinds of interesting applications for LDOs. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip that slide because I needed a picture for that. So um, Professor Kajuri asked me to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about analog devices and, and careers and things like that. You know, what, what sort of um, 
uh, job opportunities there are there. Um, any questions on the presentation so far? W was it at least semi-entertaining? Semi-entertaining? Okay. Yes, sir. I have one question yes. about your uh, silicon ferrite bead. Yes. I noticed you have about a, a one kilohertz corner frequency for one over F noise. Yes, that's correct. Are you using silicon JFETs instead of MOSFETs to do that? That I don't know. I, my gut feel is that it's just bipolar. I don't think there's JFETs in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there, there really is no voltage reference in that part. Uh, no, I take that back. It's a current reference, and I don't know how that's derived. Um, if you look at the front page of the data sheet, there's a whole bunch of patent numbers in there. So there's a lot of tricks that they play in there to, uh, to get that power supply rejection up. Um, one of them is they actually power a lot of the internal circuitry off the output voltage rather than the input voltage. So all kinds of things are flipped all around. Um, you know, there's still plenty of, uh, plenty of room for innovation there. Okay, so um, I, uh, I went to University of Maine. My first degree was agricultural mechanical engineering of all things. Um, and then I went back for a, an MSWE, and I never thought I wanted to work for a semiconductor company, right? I'd read the data sheets and I'd say, oh, that looks dull, I don't want to work there. Um, and then I went and interviewed at Linear Tech and they beat the heck out of me. It was the hardest interview I could possibly imagine. And I said, you know, I, I should probably come here. And I did not interview as an IC designer. So um, is anyone thinking about going into IC design? Like silicon level design? Okay, excellent, yeah. So silicon level design lends itself to a couple of things. I mean, it's usually a master's or, or PhD level um, uh, PhD level track. Uh, you know, master's for power electronics and bipolar electronics, I, I would say for mixed signal, for things where they're really, you know, pushing the boundaries of processes and all that is more of a, a PhD level thing. Um, lots of solid state design classes. And the one that killed it for me was long attention span. So um, I see design projects tend to, you know, they, they take a long time and, uh, you know, involve a lot of focus over, you know, months and months and years, and uh, that is not me. Um, another career path is uh, application engineer, so from chips to boards, and, and that's what I've basically spent my entire career doing. And so in the context of a semiconductor company, for me, what that meant was sitting next to the IC designer and building an example design that extracted full performance out of that part, something that customers can copy so that they don't call us up and complain that the part's not meeting its data sheet specs. And, you know, really, we take that to the extreme. We say, you know, customer, take the one square inch around the part and copy it verbatim. Don't use any creativity, just don't try to get smart or anything, just copy it, and, and you're setting yourself up for success. Um, doesn't matter, customers don't listen, and they still manage to find ways to mess it up here. Um, and in uh, application engineer, you know, bachelor is required, of course, and, and a master's is extremely helpful. Um, you know, that was the best decision I ever made was going back to UMaine to get my, uh, my MSWE. And uh, a short attention span is not a showstopper. So yes, I, I managed to keep my job for 20 years even with a short attention span. Um, and then finally, you know, system engineer is things like boxes. So um, I didn't really get into the box business until the, um, until the acquisition with, uh, with analog devices. And I've got a couple of examples that I'll, that I'll show on the, on the video camera here. So, you know, this is companies like Cisco and Apple, people that make big boxes. Um, I've always been a fan of industrial electronics, you know, measurement equipment. Um, Keysight is a big sponsor of Sonoma State, correct? Yeah, so I love Keysight test equipment. I love old HP test equipment. Um, it broke my heart when we moved from Milpitas to Santa Clara because I had to throw out a whole bunch of old HP test equipment that I'd had for years. Um, but you know, studying those old, um, studying the, the instruction manuals to those things and schematics and all that stuff is really a, a, a great way to learn. Um, so you know, the, that equipment's getting harder and harder to come by, still shows up on eBay, but the manuals are out there in electronic format. And um, you know, really, a lot of that old HP equipment, they didn't just have the instruction manual, but it was the theory behind how the darn thing worked, which was just wonderful. Um, and you know, automotive also fits in here. You know, companies like Tesla, electric car companies, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I have a bullet point down at the bottom here, um, M2K example, and I may um, 
I, I may try to fire one of these up here. So the M2K is this little oscilloscope slash function generator slash um, digital pattern generator, pattern sniffer. Uh, it has a, a zinc, Xilinx zinc SOC chip on it, um, mixed signal components, so high-speed DACs and high-speed A to Ds, and it's the most complicated thing I have ever set my eyes on. Um, it runs a, a full instance of embedded Linux, and it's just a, a wonderful little example of a, of a complete system that involves software, hardware, HDL, Verilog code, all sort of wrapped into a little box. So that's, that's my, fav my favorite system, my favorite box to play around with. Um, and then we're, we're coming to the end of our hour here, so I will um, shout out to the uh, uh, university program here. So the other, I would say 25% of my job is writing um, lab exercises and you know, doing things like this, uh, writing lab exercises for our university program. And what that is, is um, it's a big collection of open source lab material. And that, that's all free. It's uh, you know, free and open source. And it's a whole bunch of little lessons on things like you know, transistor circuits and op amps and communication circuits. And um, when the merger happened, my new boss said, you know, hey, Mark, you're from Linear. Why don't you write us a, a power curriculum? And uh, I said, I have no idea what I'm doing with power, so I'm the perfect person for this job. And you know what I mean by that was it was a way to sort of dig down into the fundamentals and you know write well written lab exercises sort of modeled after what I what I was good at. Um, the other part of this is um, low cost test equipment, and um, I, I sound like a sales pitch, but what I, I so I always give an anti sales pitch. Go onto eBay and see if you can find that function for cheaper. You know find these little cheap oscilloscopes, cheap logic analyzers and um, see what the cost is, and then see what the software interface is, see if it has a well-supported API, whether it's open source or not, and um, you know, that little widget starts to look pretty attractive. And, and I'll, I'll show some demos in a minute here. Um, and then Power Labs. So I, I just, you said that you don't have a power curriculum here, or you don't have a, that as a concentration here? Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that I'm working on now is a collection of um, a collection of introductory power labs, and you know when I when I think of back to my education, uh, you know I basically, I've been kind of a science nerd my whole life here, so I spent a lot of time as a kid building little Radio Shack kits and all that stuff, following the instructions and playing with chemistry sets and all that. Um, and there's not a lot out there for analog electronics. Um, you know, kit building is alive and well with um, you know SparkFun and Adafruit and companies like that. It's there's a lot of things out there to build. But as far as um, as far as sort of you, you know nuts and bolts educational material, a lot of times it's not until you get into first, second, third year of college before you start laying your hands on that stuff. And um, power electronics in particular, it's really weird esoteric circuits. It's you know, switching regulators with weird waveforms. Um, these are circuits that are not possible to build on a breadboard. And so what we've been doing is trying to make some simple exercises that, are, that you can build on a breadboard to start building some intuition on, uh, on how these um, switching circuits work or these, these switching regulators work. Oh, and... Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll put up a couple of, of examples of that in a, in a second here. That that's my slide deck. Um, any any other questions from from here before we show a couple of little demos? All right, no questions. We can't make my life difficult. Yes. All right. uh, so these M two Ks, uh, these are like you mentioned that it has like some labs for circuit one, circuit two. Yes, correct. All of these come for the same device. So the, the the philosophy behind those exercises is we use that we, we use that box to write the exercises and take screenshots and all that. You can totally do it with the scopes on your bench. Right. But it what it provides it's a way of having a uniform piece of test equipment for all of the exercises so everything is really consistent. Um, they are also completely LT spiced. So all of those lessons have, um, we have a, a GitHub repository for um, LT Spice material as well. So as you're going through those exercises, you can download and run the LT Spice that goes along with it. So you can run through all that stuff without any, um, w without any hardware in front of you. But, um, but of course that always helps. 
Yeah. And, and um, you know, the intent is not that it's, this is how it has to be done. The intent is use it as you see fit. If there's like a, a gap in your lab curriculum or something like that, then, you know, it's, it's there for the taking. All right. So I'm going, if, if we have a couple of minutes here, I'm going to try and, um, let's see if I can pull up that. Yeah, there we go. So just sort of a... Uh, let's see. Yeah, just to give you an idea of, of what a typical lesson like that would look at. So here, here's one that I'm working on at the moment. Um, it's buck and boost converter elements and, and open loop operation. So when I started looking at, you know, how do I do a lab for a buck or a boost converter? If I buy an IC booster buck regulator, it, it's a little black box, right? There's all kinds of stuff in there that I can't really get my hands on and I can't really play around with it. Um, I can't operate it open loop. If I open the loop, it's either gonna shoot all the way to maximum voltage or it's gonna <laughs> shoot all the way to minimum voltage and I can't go in there and play around with it and characterize it a piece at a time. And so that's what, um, so we started designing a little piece of hardware that is deconstructed. So it's not a monolithic buck regulator. It's discrete MOSFETs, discrete gate drivers, and I can really go in there and, oh, what did I say before? Engineers like to turn knobs. I've got five knobs on here. Um, and so the idea with a lesson like this is I start out with a really simple idealized buck converter in LT spice. So there's no MOSFETs on here, it's all ideal switches. So with ideal switches, I can make myself a truly perfect buck regulator with no parasitics or anything. Um, turns out I do need a little bit of parasitics in there to make the simulation converge, but I can start with something that's really almost ideal. And then I can go and derive the equations. So I can take those textbook equations and make sure that they match with LT spice. Um, and then I go down, I keep deriving equations, look at waveforms, and then finally at some point, we replace those ideal switches with real switches. So <clears throat> this, is a, this is a circuit that's actually on that little blue board here. So I've got a simulation of an actual MOSFET, I've got a real diode with real losses, I've got an inductor with its equivalent series resistance, I've got all of those non-idealities of this circuit modeled in LT Spice. And I've got a whole bunch of load resistors on that board that I can connect or disconnect. Um, this duty cycle modulator is a, a little um, a chip that we make that's called a, a timer box. It's a little pulse width modulator oscillator chip that's just perfect for this job. So I can go in there with that blue knob and twist my, adjust my duty cycle and adjust my frequency and, and all that good stuff. And then I can come down and simulate that circuit in LT Spice. So in LT Spice, I can look at my switch node that bangs back and forth between ground and my output voltage. And I can look at a simulation of my inductor current, like all the important stuff about a buck converter, I can see that in LT Spice. And then I can come down and look at reality. So it's a little hard to see with this contrast here, but this, this scope shot, or I get to say this at 46 years old and I love it, it's a scopey shot. So the, the program, the, the GUI that, that works with that box is called Scopey. Um, looks, looks identical. So you know, I go through the LT spice and then I look at it, holy smokes, I get agreement in front of me here. And not only that, um, if I look at the output voltage, I'm actually modeling those non-idealities. I'm modeling the forward drop of the diode, the loss due, the IR losses of that inductor. I get agreement to within a few millivolts there. And, and that's really what it's all about, you know, building intuition and understanding, hey, why is my output voltage lower than those textbook equations? Well, because I've got parasitics. I've got these things that come in there and um, um, I, I have parasitics that, uh, that depart from ideal. And I feel guilty about doing this because I want students to be doing this as well. Um, I'm feeling guilty for learning so much about this. I've never touched power electronics before. Um, so so the, the burden is on me to write this up in a, in a nice way that people can follow along. And yeah, so this is, once again, this is, this is actually up on our public website at the moment, but it's, uh, it's in, in development here. Yeah, and then this is also pretty neat, going from 
a continuous conduction mode where the current in my inductor is always flowing. If I drop the load on my switching regulator, I get this funky waveform here. So, you know, once again, that, that's a pretty strange looking waveform that you don't really encounter until you start probing around um, a switching regulator. And the first time I saw that on a scope, I said, what the heck is going on here? I didn't understand it, but that's actually, that's normal, that's reality. Okay, and that is about, yeah, so that's, that's all we'll talk about here. And, um, Yeah, I think if I think after we're done here, if if we hang around, I might set up another couple of experiments here, um, just just for fun. So um, this also does a, uh, a network analyzer. So network analyzer, meaning actually I can pull this up on YouTube. And and this is the last thing. Sorry, what's the sound playing? Uh, 100 mega samples per second. Yeah, so, so sample rate, uh, you mean of the, of the scope? Right. Yeah, it's 100 mega samples per second and about 30 megahertz of analog bandwidth. Yeah, so enough to digitize the whole AM radio band, but not FM.